Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the history of Central America, from colonization to mass migration, and the line that connects one to the other. My guest for this conversation is Aviva Chomsky, professor of history and the coordinator of Latin American studies at Salem State University. We're going to be talking about her book. It's called Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. She joins us via Zoom. Aviva Chomsky, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So you make the argument right at the beginning of the book that history matters and that forgetting history also matters. And you connect it straight to our I guess, national dialogue, debate, and circumstances over migration and immigration today. Can, can we start by talking about why history and even forgetting history matters in our political discourse over uh, immigration today? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'll just begin by referencing um, Kamala Harris's recent speech, which I just listened to this morning, um, her her meeting with the president of Guatemala. And, you know, we hear a lot, we're hearing a lot right now from the Biden administration about root causes of migration. And I was really um, disappointed to hear how she talked about what, what the Biden administration is seeing as root causes of migration. So it's correct, but it's partial. So it's not really correct if it's partial. So, you know, she talked about a lot of the immediate issues that are in fact causes of migration, poverty, corruption, violence, um, drought, climate change. Um, and all of those things are causes, but what she didn't do is talk about what's the root of those causes. Um, and I was especially, um, struck by the way she talked about US responsibility towards Central America. And she said, we're responsible because we all share the same hemisphere and we're neighbors. So we're responsible because this is our common home, this Western hemisphere. And that is a complete papering over of the role that the United States has played over the last 150 years in creating the poverty, the violence, the corruption, the, uh, the gangs, the, uh, the climate change, the droughts that are affecting Central America. So, you know, where we look at root causes, where we decide the roots are, has a lot to do with what kinds of policies we think we need to implement. Um, you know, once you once you identify the cause, then you say, OK, so this is what we're going to do to change it. So if we identify the problem or the cause of the problem as what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border, that leads us to a certain set of solutions. If we identify the problem as what's happening right now in Central America, that leads us to yet another set of solutions. And if we identify the problem as the long-term US policy towards Central America, then that leads us to a very different set of solutions. So, so yeah, history matters a lot. And how we, what we erase from history and what we focus on um, matters a lot to the kinds of decisions that we make, uh, how we understand what's happening today and how the, what kind of decisions we make about how to confront the, the problems facing Central Americans, U.S. Americans, the world today. Certainly want to go through this history with you. But when you say if we look at the problem in a historical sense, it presents a, a set of solutions or, or ways of, of dealing with it. Like, like what? How, how does incorporating, I think, the history and I think people will be somewhat familiar uh, at least broadly speaking, on the history we're going to be talking about, the, the long arc of it of U.S. involvement in Latin America. But, but how, how are policy responses different if we were to incorporate this history over the last two, three hundred years? So, you know, President Biden has proposed a, a plan for aid to Central America. Um, and he, he titled his plan, and, and if you look at what it consists of, it's for prosperity and security in Central America. Um, and so what do those terms mean? Security 
means basically military and policing. So providing US aid for military and policing, especially in the interests of stopping migration. And I can talk about some of the specifics for that too, but stopping migration um, by militarizing Mexico's Southern border, by militarizing Guatemala's Southern border, by militarizing the interior of Guatemala um, in anti-immigrant raids and policies and in militarizing Honduras' Southern borders. Um, so, so that's the security part. The prosperity part relies heavily on um, foreign aid for a particular kind of economic development based on international investment. Um, and if you look at the past 200 years of Central American history, um, economic development based on an export economy, based on foreign investment, um, has been exactly the root cause of uh, all of the problems that we're seeing in Central America today. And military and uh, the development of military and police forces in Central America is very historically rooted in the protection and development of this foreign oriented, um, foreign investment and export oriented development economy. So basically what he's saying is we want to do more of exactly what has caused the problem to begin with. We'll use nice words to describe it. We'll call it prosperity and we'll call it security, but it's basically same old, same old um, in terms of, of what he's proposing to do. That, that's interesting. We always used nice words about our policy in the United in Latin America. I mean, has there ever been a time where we're going to come and we're going to take their resources and, and, and dominate their politics? Well, I mean, the interesting thing is if you go into the archives and read the U.S. government documents, they're very clear about that. Um, it's only in their, their public pronouncements are very different from what they're saying privately. Um, and um, I've done a lot of research in um, some of this US internal government correspondence regarding uh, the Cuban revolution, which of course is in a way sets the, the model for post-World War II um, US policy towards Central America. But um, what US government officials were saying about the Cuban revolution was if we let, like it's clear that the Cuban government is following policies that are in the interests of its population and not in the interests of US foreign investors. And if we let the Cuban revolution succeed, other Latin American governments are going to want to do the same thing, like divert their resources away from the foreign investors and towards meeting the needs of their population. And so we cannot allow the Cuban government to succeed in doing this because that would be terrible for US investors in other countries. So very explicit. In, in, in Very explicit. Of, of course, that's not what they say to the public. The public, they say, oh, we're so terrified of communism. Um, threat, uh, danger, fear, <laughs> U.S. interests is sort of general term. Well, who in the United States exactly is interested in making sure that the profits of the United Fruit Company are not threatened? I'm already going to deviate from the chronological order I wanted to take in our conversation. But when you're talking about the nice language that we use towards U.S. policy in Latin America, I, I immediately thought of Franklin D. Roosevelt and his administration and a policy that was called the, the good neighbor policy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, it's good if you ignore the history that brought us to the good neighbor policy. So in order to talk about what's wrong with the good neighbor policy, I have to go back. <laughs> We're going to be wreaking havoc with chronology here. But we well, um, have the time, though, so feel free to do it. <laughs> so basically, the good neighbor policy implemented in the 1930s by Franklin D. Roosevelt follows the period of what's known as dollar diplomacy. Another nice word, because what dollar diplomacy actually meant is that military intervention to protect the interests of US dollars. So starting around the end of the 19th century, um, in the beginning of the 20th with the Spanish-American War, um, the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and you know, the, 
Kamala Harris was kind of quoting the Monroe Doctrine uh, in what I listened to this morning, now that I think of it, um, that you know, the United States is responsible for the security of the hemisphere. Um, but so the Monroe Doctrine was basically, a, and this is um, from the 1820s, you know, shortly after the founding of the United States, um, the Monroe Doctrine was basically directed against Europeans, warning Europeans to stay out of Central America. There was no um, threat of communism or Russia or China at the time. It was all about Britain and France um, that were the threat to US interests in Latin America. Um, but so the Monroe Doctrine basically stated to the Europeans, this is our hemisphere, stay out. And we reserve the right to intervene if you try to get in. Um, by the end of the 19th century, US economic interests had almost completely taken over, um, especially in Central America and the Caribbean. And um, the Roosevelt Corollary in uh, 1906, 19, yeah, 1906, um, to the Monroe Doctrine expanded the United States intention to intervene, uh, not only when there was a foreign threat, but when there were domestic threats to US interests. So if- And this is Theodore Roosevelt, just to be clear, because we were talking about FDR. Theodore Roosevelt, yes, yes, yes. TR, yeah. TR. Um, so, so reserving the right, declaring the right of the United States to intervene militarily if Latin American governments fail to protect the interests of US banks and US investors in their countries. So, in, and this, you know, in some ways, um, you know, it, it took on new rationales over time, but uh, has, has basically been the basis of US policy towards Central America ever since. Um, so the first two decades of the 20th century, he repeated US military interventions to put down domestic disorder. Domestic disorder is when people try to fight for their rights. Um, when government, and so one of the things the United States did was to take over all of the, the debts from, from European countries in terms of, of establishing US control there and then establishing control over the economic decisions. It's like an early version of what the IMF and World Bank did after World War II. You owe us money, so therefore we're gonna take over all of your political decisions because uh, your top priority has to be um, making decisions that will allow you to pay back your, the debts that you owe to us. In that, at that time, it was to private US banks rather than to multilateral, multinational uh, bank, banks like the World Bank. Um, so military interventions um, in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Nicaragua, that lead to long-term occupations to try to establish the kind of political, social, and economic system that the United States wants, and military. So in all of those countries, it's to create and train a military force that's going to keep the population down. And um, in all of those cases, uh, leading to a, a particular kind of dictatorship, which in Nicaragua is the Somoza dictatorship, in Haiti it's Duvalier, in, in the Dominican Republic it's Trujillo, in Cuba, a kind of parallel, it's um, Batista. In the Philippines, another kind of parallel, it's Ferdinand Marcos. Long-term personalized dictatorships who are basically rely on US support and personal aggrandizement, corruption, and um, repression of any kind of popular organizing in, in their countries. So they're very personalistic dictatorships that come out of their relationship with the United States and to these military forces that the United States created. Now, so finally getting to the good neighbor. Um, so Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, renounces dollar diplomacy, says we're not gonna intervene in Central America and the Caribbean anymore. We're gonna be a good neighbor. Uh, we're just gonna be friends with everybody. But everybody is those corrupt, violent 
dictatorships that we have created and installed in those countries. So um, as, as FDR is reputed to have said about either Trujillo or Somoza, uh, um, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Um, so the good neighbor means accepting uh, and supporting dictatorship, just like dollar diplomacy did, um, but now we just call it something different. We've succeeded in, in establishing these dictatorships. Now we're gonna show how friendly we are to Central America. Do you see a similarity with, as we were talking earlier about the policy that Kamala Harris has, is, is laid out and that Joe Biden ha has laid out? Again, we're, we're not Donald Trump, we're, we're going to be better than that, but nonetheless, is there a similarity to we're going to be better to sort of the corrupt elements that we've helped prop up, I guess? Well, you know, there's certainly lip service critiquing corruption, but in terms of policy towards Central America, Trump did use much uglier language. You know, he didn't talk as much about how we're all brothers and we're all, uh, you know, the same hemisphere. So we all care about each other, but the policies actually haven't been that different. And we should just remember that it was under Joe Biden's um, predecessor, Democrat, um, the Obama administration, that the most recent US support for a military overthrow of a mildly progressive government in Central America occurred. This was in 2009 in Honduras when, um, and prior to 2009, I should also mention, there was hardly any migration from Honduras to the United States. Honduras had elected Manuel Zelaya, who was no radical, but was a kind of move to the left after being elected and um, implementing mildly populist kinds of policies like raising the minimum wage that's always the kiss of death for a Latin American government to do. The United States does not like Latin American governments raising the minimum wage because that harms US investors in, in Latin America, harms US investors because they're forced to pay higher wages. So almost any concession to the wants and needs of the domestic population is seen as a threat by US investors. Um, you know, it's kind of like the most raw form of capitalism, whereas in the United States, we have at least gone through a period in the 20th century of a kind of a bargain between capitalism and labor, where, you know, democratization, rights for workers, the right to organize unions, decent wages, benefits, um, all of those things were accepted by capital in the interest of labor harmony and creating a consuming class among the working class. That has never happened in Central America, um, that kind of bargain. And foreign investors have no interest in creating a consuming class among Central American workers. They just want pure exploitation, pure and simple. Access to the resources, access to the workers, no regulation. Um, and they aren't subject to the kind of democratic controls that, that capital, at least in theory, is subject to here because there is always the threat of US intervention to overthrow a democratic government. So the overthrow of Celaya's government in 2009, not the first time that the United States has overthrown democratically elected governments in Central America. We can look back to Guatemala in 54, to Nicaragua in the 1980s, and of course, to other parts of Latin America, like to Chile in 1973. But um, so, so this is the Obama administration that collaborates with and celebrates a military coup against Manuel Zelaya in, in 2009. And um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton still brags openly about her role and how they helped Honduras um, get back to a better climate for US foreign investment. So, so I would say there's been a remarkable consistency between Democrats and Republicans in terms of this commitment to an economic development model in which the interests of US foreign investors 
are prioritized. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Aviva Chomsky, professor of history and coordinator of Latin American studies at Salem State University. She is the author of the book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. For our friends listening who, you know, Avi and I, and, and she said earlier I could call her Avi, uh, Avi and I will only be able to really scratch the surface uh, of this great history that's really worth knowing. And But luckily, uh, Avi Chomsky is going to be involved in a KPFA-sponsored event tonight that everyone can join online. She'll be in conversation with my friend and colleague, Mickey Huff, and that is going to be at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight, Pacific Standard Time. And I, I guess one one good thing about the pandemic is during the KPFA events, uh, anyone anywhere in the country or the world could actually uh, get in and, 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 and join uh, such an event. Just go to our website, kpfa.org, and you can find out all the details for tonight's event with uh, Avi Chomsky and Mickey Huff starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And I'll give details again about that event later in our conversation. Uh, Avi Chomsky, uh, you, you, you mentioned earlier that beyond Honduras, it wasn't the first time the United States acted because a country had raised its minimum wage. When else has this happened? Um, well, um, another example where raising the minimum wage specifically was a, um, a trigger was in Haiti in the 1990s when Arist with the overthrow of Aristide. Um, but raising the minimum wage I was also using as a kind of a shorthand for a set of policies that um, I think we can also look at in terms of um, the Arbenz government in Guatemala in, 19, in the mid 1950s where we have a democratically elected government um, of course, Aristide and Celaya were also democratically elected, um, but a democratically elected government that is implementing raising the minimum wage in the context of a set of policies that were not radical if you look at the United States, um, that is guaranteeing workers the right to organize unions. Uh, guaranteeing plantation workers, rural agricultural workers, rights to unionize, land reform, um, policies that were not radical if looked at from a domestic United States perspective, but that threatened US interests in Central America. Now, in the case of Guatemala, there was one particular company, the United Fruit Company, which owned a third of Guatemala's territory that was being subject to the land reform. And the land reform was very carefully designed. It only affected land that was not being used productively. It compensated landowners um, based on the value of the land that they declared um, on their taxes that they paid for Guatemala. Um, but this was an unendurable threat to the United Fruit Company, first of all, because they lied when they filed their taxes in Guatemala and they underestimated the value of the land. So then they protested that they weren't being paid the full value because they had declared, obviously the value they had declared was, was false. Um, and the company was also very, and, and the company said that they needed this unproductive land because, um, they might need to expand or because uh, you know, they, they needed to, to hold land in reserve. And they were very threatened by the labor legislation that is uh, the, the guarantees of, of labor rights. Now the United Fruit Company was not the only factor that was threatened. Um, Guatemalan elites plantation, most who were mostly agricultural elites, um, coffee growers, many of them um, German immigrants to Guatemala from the earlier part of the century uh, were also quite threatened by this. So um, the United States had a, a, was directly influenced by the United Fruit Company, which implemented a, a vast propaganda campaign aimed at the US public and at the US Congress 
um, claiming that Arbenz's government was communist and, and was a threat you know, to US interests, that nebulous term. Um, but they also had natural allies among the Guatemalan elite. Now this Guatemalan elite, their natural allies had no way of mobilizing any popular movement against Arbenz, um, but they were very happy to accept a, uh, a military coup sponsored by the United States to, to put their set of interests back into, back into place. Um, in Nicaragua, in 19, after the 1979 revolution, it's actually, if you look at the documents, quite similar to the Cuban revolution in terms of how the US government is weighing its options. And do we want to allow the Sandinista revolution to succeed? Obviously they're really popular. The kinds of policies they're putting into place, it's the same kind of set of policies, uh, expanding investment in health and education, uh, granting workers rights, land reform, popular mobilization. Um, do we want to allow this to succeed? Well, no, because it threatens the model of economic development that we want for Latin America. Um, and in the case of Nicaragua, there was no specific US company that was being threatened. It was more the, the threat of a good example um, that, that Nicaragua posed that could threaten US interests, that is US companies elsewhere in the hemisphere. So, I mean, your listeners are probably more familiar with the decade long war that the United States waged against Nicaragua and the 1984. So, I mean, the Sandinistas took power in an armed revolution in 1979, clearly with overwhelming popular support, but um, they held their first elections in 1984. Um, but the elections made no difference in terms of the, and the Sandinistas won the election. Uh, but that made no difference in terms of the US commitment to armed overthrow of the Sandinista government when they were ruling as a, a junta, having been victorious in the revolution, or when they were in power as, as a democratically elected government. How deep is the US involvement in, in these acts? And, and maybe specifically what happened with the military coup in Guatemala in the 1950s? What, what was the actual role that the United States played there. So, and, and remember that this is before the Cuban revolution. This is before the Bay of Pigs invasion. It's 1954. Um, but in the case of Guatemala, the United States was completely uh, the orchestrator of this so-called counter-revolution. Um, they chose who was going to lead it. The CIA trained um, a, uh, a very small force um, and the United States provided air support for the, uh, for the so-called invasion, um, for the invasion uh, when this, this small force crossed into Guatemala and um, the government of Guatemala decided to avoid a bloodbath and not to arm the population even though much of the population was demanding to be armed to resist this incursion. Um, but uh, so, you know, it's hard to say, as, as I said, there were certainly sectors of the Guatemalan elite who supported this move, um, but if it had not been for the overwhelming US decision, US arming, US training, um, U.S. orchestration of this coup, what direction would things have gone? We don't really know. Was a, our support for this coup in the 1950s, was, was it a departure from the FDR's good neighbor policy? Did it, did it begin a new kind of involvement in Central America or? Yes, um, it did. Uh, you know, our post-World War II policy, foreign policy, was a Cold War foreign policy, where um, the United States, States emerged from World War II as the sole global superpower. Um, you know, people, I think, think of the, the Cold War as two superpowers competing, the United States and the USSR. But if you think about World War II, um, the USSR has been decimated and devastated by World War II. The United States didn't get involved in World War II till the very end 
World War II was not fought on US territory. Um, the USSR lost more people than any other country. Um, it's, it's agriculture, it's industry was devastated. Um, so there was really only one superpower at the end of World War II and the United States was determined that it would remain that way. Nevertheless, the USSR was very useful as a threat and the Cold War was fought primarily in the third world. That is the United States was fighting the USSR in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Laos, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, um, in Chile, uh, in Guatemala. So, um, so the post-World War II period is a period of extremely active military intervention kind of recapitulating what we were doing during dollar diplomacy. But now um, with the rationale of the threat of communism. Avina Chomsky is our guest. She's a professor of history and coordinator of Latin American studies at Salem State University. And we are in conversation about her book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. Again, for our listeners who want more of this history, well, tonight, Avi Chomsky will be a part of a KPFA-sponsored event with my friend and colleague, Mickey Huff. You can view this online, and we have all the details at the KPFA website. Just go to kpfa.org. Aviva Chomsky and Mickey Huff will be talking more about this history starting at 6 p.m. tonight, and that is Pacific Standard Time. Again, go to kpfa.org to find those details. Avi Chomsky, I was interested in this kind of evolution and in, in, in change that we would see over time of what was called the Monroe Doctrine. And in particular, when you talked about what happened in the early 20th century with Theodore Roosevelt, not FDR, but TR, and, and dollar uh, democracy, and how diplomacy. Were, uh, diplomacy, excuse me, dollar diplomacy, right? Uh, and, and how they were very explicit about what that was supposed to be about. Is that what you found in, in reading the documents from, from that time? You mentioned earlier how explicit the government memos were about the policies. Well, the difference is that in the early 20th century, they didn't have to hide it. Um, they were quite open with the US population about their goals and what they were doing. Um, that doesn't mean there was no opposition. There was opposition in the United States during the early 20th century. Um, but, uh, but in the post-World War II period, um, in the Cold War context, the United States is promoting itself as this defender of democracy around the world. Um, and, you know, if you look at the history of domestic U.S. politics at the time, um, some of the openings for the civil rights movement and the, uh, the, the, the reforms to make US democracy more real at home that happened after World War II are also really influenced by this Cold War context. That is the United States is promoting itself globally as the, the, the paragon and the bastion of human rights and democracy, but look what's happening at home. So the, um, the need to make some of these reforms at home is also a, a product of the Cold War. The reform of the US immigration system in 1965 is also a product of the Cold War. Um, and um, not to detract from the, the power of the popular movements in the United States at the time, of course, they, they were a major factor, but you know, the, it was global and domestic, the, uh, the juggling that was going on in terms of the legislative reforms that happened in the US. Um, so after World War II, the United States um, is dealing with world revolution, anti-colonial revolutions in Africa, in Asia, uh, as well as in Latin America, where it's not anti-colonial, but anti-neo-colonial um, revolutions. That is, Latin American countries have been independent since the early 19th century, but still economically dependent. Um, so promoting its model of development and human rights as, uh, as in the best interests of 
everybody, not just in the interests of US corporations. So in some ways, US policy becomes more duplicitous. That is, it's more necessary to justify these policies globally and to the US domestic population, and even to try to appeal to populations in Latin America by saying, you know, we're the ones who are gonna bring you the good stuff. So I, I think there's more of a divergence between what's said publicly and privately in the second half of the 20th century than there is in the first half. Let's talk more about colonialism and just going farther back in time. It seems like that's the chronology we've taken as we'll just <laughs> work our way back. Um, but of course, all the countries that we are talking about in this hemisphere do come out of an era of colonialism, including the United States. But I do find it interesting how you break up independence movements on this continent, especially in the 18th and 19th century. On one hand, you have the United States War for Independence in 1776. And then on the other end, I guess, of the spectrum, you have the Haitian Revolution uh, in the 1790s. And then you make an argument that most of the other countries throughout the hemisphere fall somewhere between the United States and the Haitian uh, revolutions. T tell me about that dynamic and, and, and the differences maybe to begin with between the United States uh, movement for independence and, and that of Haiti's. So the United States, you know, we think of it as an anti-colonial revolution, right? Um, but it's very unique among, the US revolution is very unique among anti-colonial revolutions globally in that pretty much every other anti-colonial revolution has been carried out by the people who were colonized against the colonizers. The US revolution was carried out not by the people who were colonized, that is Native Americans, African Americans. It was carried out by the colonizers, the British colonizers. Um, and if you look at, you know, we could call them white people, <laughs> the British colonizers, what were their complaints against the crown? Why did they want independence? And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the British crown was actually retreating from its colonial commitment to North America, to those colonizers. Um, the British crown was starting to question the institution of slavery. And in fact, shortly after the US became independent, the British abolished slavery. Um, the colonizers in the United States did not want to abolish slavery. They wanted to make sure it continued. Um, the British were withdrawing from their military commitment to expansion in North America. Um, in the proclamation of 1763, the British Crown recognized Native American rights to lands to the west of the Appalachian Mountains, kind of drew a line basically down the Appalachian Mountains. Um, saying that they would not provide military support for colonization beyond that line. Well, I, the this is an important, yeah, this is an important point. I, I just really want to underline what you're saying because I don't think most people know this, but but it's true. The, the the British at the time, the British Empire was telling its subjects here in this in in our portion of the world not to go farther east, farther west, farther west. Yeah, excuse me, farther west. Um. And the reasons that the British were doing this was not because they were becoming anti-colonial human rights paragons, but because of their global empire. And supporting these North American colonizers was not top priority in their global equations. They were busy colonizing India, they had the Caribbean colonies, much more profitable ways to, uh, to focus their energy than on this group of colonizers. And I think it's really important that we call them colonizers. You know, we use this term colonists when we talk about US history, but they were colonizers. Um, let's, let's dispense with euphemisms. So, um, and if you look at the Declaration of Independence itself, where uh, the colonizers list their complaints against the crown of Great Britain and what it has done that has required them to declare their independence as colonizers. Um, one is 
he has incited domestic insurrections among us. That means by talking about ending slavery, inciting domestic rebellion means talking about ending slavery because domestic rebellion means slave rebellion. Um, he has made it more difficult for colonizers, that is us, to obtain more lands. He has made it immigration more difficult. Um, so the colonizers want to expand the colonial project. And that is a clear goal of the American, so-called American revolution is to expand the colonial project, to institutionalize, to make sure that the institution of slavery is not challenged and to continue with territorial expansion. So I say this is really unusual among anti-colonial revolutions because the anti-colonial revolutions we're more familiar with um, throughout the colonizers. They were revolutions by the people who were colonized. And I mean, Haiti is a perfect example of this. So in Haiti, the French were thrown out. Um, the Haitian revolution, although you know, it's complicated, it went through a number of different stages and I don't have time to get into all of the details, but the Haitian revolution by 1804 was a revolution of enslaved people of Haiti who threw out the planter class, who declared Haitian independence as a black country. So this is exactly what the US colonizers were trying to avoid in their revolution. Um, so, and I say that the Latin American revolutions fell somewhere in between um, because while the, the, the leaders of the Latin American revolutions uh, tried to mobilize a multiracial, multi-ethnic, anti-colonial um, movement. And there were many indigenous uprisings in favor of independence, in, in, in support of the independence movements in Latin America. But the people who really emerged as the leaders of the new states tended to be Spanish descended and tended to want to keep much of the colonial economic structure in place. So there were no other revolutions that were as revolutionary as the Haitian revolution um, in Latin America. And if you look at in Central America, there's also, you know, much of the 19th century is spent in civil war in Latin America. And part of the, these civil wars are not only among competing sectors of the elite, but they're among different independence projects. Um, and we see this, especially in, in Guatemala, these competing independence projects. But by the end of the 19th century, um, by the 1870s or so, the elite independence project has won out pretty much everywhere in Latin America, certainly everywhere in Central America and Mexico as well. And this is something that's being worked out through the, the, the 19th century? Yes. So, so yeah, by the 1870s, the, um, the elite project has won out. The elites are firmly in control of the institutions of government. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, these are mostly agrarian elites. Uh, planter classes. Um, their goal is to sponsor white European immigration, just like the United States is doing in the 19th century um, after independence, trying to whiten the population by encouraging immigration from Europe. And remember, that was right in the Declaration of Independence, that, that that's what they wanted to do. But um, Latin American Elites are also trying to, to foster white immigration, and they have a little bit more flexible definition of, of white than the United States does. Um, they, like the United States, they prefer Northern Europeans, but like the United States, what they're mostly getting by the end of the 19th century is Southern Eastern Europeans, Middle Easterners, 
um, you know, Jews, Catholics, all those people that the United States is a little, uh, a little nervous about. Um, uh, to rebuild the export economy um, with heavy reliance on foreign investment and on repression of the indigenous populations in order to maintain their access to land and access to not just maintain, expand their access to land and access to cheap labor. So by the end of the 19th century, it's what's known as the period of liberal dictatorship, um, liberal in the economic sense that is in terms of fostering foreign investment and um, ending protectionism. Uh, uh, lead to a period of real devastation for the indigenous populations in Latin America. Some call it the second conquest, where their lands are taken, where they're displaced, dispossessed, and new types of forced labor are, are recreated, and new state institutions that are based on repression of the local population and promotion of foreign interests, that, that's the root of the states of Central America as they're founded in the late 19th century. With this dynamic in mind, how, how do you see the, the figure considered the great liberator of, of Latin America, someone like Simon Bolivar? So I think Simon Bolivar has a very mixed legacy. Um, I think the concept of independence has enormous resonance for Latin Americans, um, but many Latin Americans believe that their independence still has not been achieved. And I'm thinking of a song from the 1970s by um, Inti Ilimani uh, called La Segunda Independencia, the second independence, and talking about uh, how the more radical dreams of independence that that, that existed in the early 19th century have not been fulfilled. And we need, we need another Simon Bolivar. We need another independence to have real independence. And I think part of the issue is political versus economic independence as people came to see in the 20th century that political independence doesn't necessarily mean that much in a global economy that is stacked against you and that is controlled by institutions that is nominal political independence uh, doesn't really mean anything under global capitalism. Um, and so the term neo-colonialism really comes to the fore in, in 20th century, late 20th century Latin America, that, that our independence is, is not fully realized, that, that we are now neo-colonies of the United States and of the international financial institutions. We can't really make decisions for ourselves because we're still controlled from outside. Hence, back to the first question I had to you, the importance of, of history and in this history specifically and in looking at our, our current situation. And it sounds that what we get out of the independence movement and, and those structures and, and a sense of hierarchy is something we're still grappling with today. Yes, um, and I would say a sense of hierarchy, not only internally to Latin America, but globally. Aviva Chomsky has been our guest. Aviva Chomsky is a professor of history and also coordinator of Latin American studies at Salem State University. She is the author of the book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. For our listeners who want more of this history and even be able to ask some of your own questions, you'll be able to do so tonight as Aviva Chomsky will be participating in a KPFA-sponsored event that begins at 6 p.m., uh, Pacific Standard Time. It's an event that you can participate online. Just go to our website at kpfa.org. Just look for the event details. It'll be right there on the front page. Just scroll down a little bit uh, and you'll see a photo of both of Eva Chomsky and uh, Mickey Huff. And uh, you could sign up for tonight's event that starts at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Ivy Chomsky, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I certainly thank you for taking this time to join us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on.